ladies and gentlemen, um, we're live now with uh, Brigadier General Retired Don Boldick, candidate for the U.S. Senate in New Hampshire. Uh, General Boldick, uh, how you doing, sir? Uh, I take it you've been pretty, bu- pretty busy today, eh? Yeah, I've been pretty busy. Yeah, um, I'm trying to get this. Uh, Just right. This, uh, can you see me okay? Does it matter if you see me or? No, it's 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 good, right? Well, right there is good. Yeah, right there. That's a good spot right there. We can hear you just fine and we can see you just fine. How are you doing today, sir? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me on. I apologize for coming in a bit late. I had some uh, supporters stop by the house to buy some Don Baldick for U.S. Senate hats. And I was sitting at the kitchen table having a great discussion with them. And I lost track of time. So I apologize. No, no need to apologize, sir. Uh, in fact, that's what mm-hmm. I told people. I said, I suspect that he's probably been interrupted because I know we got confirmation from your PA or, or, or I'm not sure if he's your manager or whatever, but I call him your PA. Jimmy Jimmy responded to me about 13 minutes before the hour and said, hey, he's really looking forward to it. He's excited. And and you are incredibly reliable. You're a professional. So I attributed to someone intruding in your time and space that's <laughs> coming into your battle space. So not a problem, sir. Hey, listen, um. I, I, I want to talk to you and my, my co-host on the Common Sense Conservatives asked me to get in touch with the other day. I was negligent. I was so swamped with things. I didn't get a chance to do that. Uh, so my apologies uh, just uh, to my co-host over there, uh, Todd, and to John on that channel. But uh, you're very responsive. And, and I think they'd like to get you on next week for a few minutes if possible. Uh, but anyway, I asked you to come on specifically to talk about Bob Woodward's new book. Now, Bob Woodward, of course, from the fame Woodward and Bernstein, Deep Throat, Watergate tapes back in the 70s and a, a whole series of books, including one I thought was very good about leadership during the Gulf War at the strategic level. Mm-hmm. Um, I think he's a very good journalist and a good author, but uh, not everything he's come out in his books has always been quite right, but most of it's pretty good. He has a new book coming out with a co-author, and apparently, the I haven't seen the book yet, but the allegations are that General Milley called the senior officer in the People's Liberation Army in China to give them reassurances before the election on October 30th, and again, I guess, either on the 6th of January or the 8th of January, about uh, not to worry, I'm paraphrasing because I, I haven't seen the book, I'm just reading from media reports, not to worry, this is under control, the president isn't in charge of this stuff. I mean, that's kind of the sense of it. If in fact that's true, that's beyond shocking. I mean, I you know, Woodward has, has got his sources, he backs up his stuff. So I'm just sitting here shaking my head. Can you imagine a chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff actually circumventing our foreign policy, the Secretary of State, the President of the United States, to call a foreign military leader to give them information about what we're going to do and not do? Now, now you as the Special Forces Africa commander interacted with leaders in other countries all the time, but you did so within the nexus and the ages of the chain of command. You didn't step out of your lane and just say, we're going to do this in contradiction to what others were. By the light looks better there, sir. It looks good. looks good with the light on. But you never did that. Did did, did I miss something? Am I missing a step here? No, you're not missing a step at all. And you're you're absolutely right. Um, If true, and I always say that, um, you know, because it's necessary to say it. uh, But if this is true, this is sits somewhere between dereliction of duty and treason. And there's a lot of other things, you know, usurping authority, undue command influence, you know, a lot of the things that we've heard that are going on. uh, This is this is something that needs to be investigated. You know, think about what we're doing here. We we've taken Lieutenant Colonel Scheller and we relieved him for duty for simply doing something that I thought uh, was part of his duties and responsibilities. Right. Um, And. Lieutenant Colonel Lohmeyer, the Air Force officer that was relieved, the Navy captain that was relieved during COVID, um, the botched uh, investigation in um, in Niger on the on the um, ambush there, and then multiple botched uh, investigations in Iraq and in in Afghanistan, uh, holding our subordinates accountable for things, uh, and relieving them even before there's an investigation, just on the mere suspicion that they may have done something illegal, immoral, or negligently unsafe, or inconsistent with regulations and policies. And this meets that criteria. And the longer this perception exists, it becomes reality. And uh, I am very concerned about it because service members are contacting me and they're very concerned about it. But I got to tell you, the hubris that I've seen in the general officer corps over the last 20 years, the complete and utter uh, mishandling 
uh, of Afghanistan, policies in Africa and in other places, uh, military strategy, approach, tactics. Um, it doesn't surprise me that he would um, put it this way. I'm disappointed, not surprised that he would usurp or insert himself in a process that um, is outside the scope of his duties and responsibilities as the advisor to the president of the United States. Uh, and those that have come before him, I've listened to their conversation. They always think they're right. They think they're right ahead of assessments of their subordinates. They think they're right. They've created this environment since after Vietnam that um, has drifted away from the George Catlett Marshall ideas of officer, senior officer leadership of loyalty to the American people, loyalty to our constitution, loyalty to our oath, loyalty to our organization, loyalty to our people before we put ourselves in that equation. And it's been reversed, right? It's, it's organizational nepotism. It's the club. It's the people in the club above everybody else. And so this was sparked by the, uh, you know, very poorly managed withdrawal from Afghanistan and all the policy, you just walk this back, look what's going on on the border. He has a responsibility as an advisor for what's going on on the border as well. And look at the disaster there. And now we have this, right? Uh, and he was the three-star in Afghanistan when we, we told him, my subordinates told him, Rand Corporation told him, bad idea to change strategy in 2013 and 14. They did it anyways, and it resulted in higher U.S. casualties, and the Taliban gaining control of the rural areas again in Afghanistan, which hurt our strategic position. So I got to tell you, this is very serious. He needs to be relieved of his duties and responsibilities. There needs to be an, an investigation and he needs to account for his actions more so than having a press release by one of his subordinates or the Secretary of Defense saying, um, I still trust him, but remember, I was not the Secretary of Defense at this time. So isn't that a clever cop out? <laughs> and then um, the President of the United States saying he's a patriot. Well, we're not questioning whether he's a patriot or not. We're questioning whether he he went beyond the um, his duties and responsibilities as an advisor he negatively influenced or unduly influenced other subordinates to follow this, this, uh, you know, this behavior. And he reached out to the, uh, uh, the speaker of the house, someone who is in succession to the current, you know, to president Trump and gave his concerns there and then contacted our existential threat, China, and told them that he was going to give them pre-warning if anything happened, because, you know, he believes the president is unstable. Uh, so when did he become the guy that determines this inside our system of government? Well, I think it's a fair question, sir. And listen, I, I've got to say the following, and I'm, I'm sure you're going to echo my thoughts on this, but just to get your take on it. Listen, I, I'm just made. I'm a graduate of L'Ecole L'Etat Major, the Tunisian Staff College, where they focused on civil control over the military, following our example, our long historic example. I've taught at the Nigerian War College. I was the first American military engagement ever at the G5 Sahel Defense College, where I also taught their faculty. And then I also taught and frequently spoke at the Botswana Staff College. And of course, I was director of African Studies, U.S. Army War College. The hallmark of all my interaction with my African counterparts, contemporaries, subordinates, and seniors, the hallmark has always been civil authority over the military. That's the key to success. The people that, the, that they're chosen by the people of your country to lead your country, they have political control. The military is subordinate to them. Otherwise, we see what we see in West Africa, Mali, Chad. Now we just saw it in Guinea, coup after coup after coup, an attempted coup in Niger this year, just days before the elected president takes office. Uh, we're back to the coup era in West Africa again. This is very chilling, sir. I'm, I'm, I'm abs if, if there's any truth to these statements, I, this is insane. As you said, we're relieving junior officers or, or field grade officers for offenses that are far less egregious, far less egregious. This is tantamount. I've heard people say to treason. I've got a hard time not agreeing with them. 
Oh, I do too. And, you know, it's why I signed that letter with 150, you know, other, you know, concerned general officers and admirals. Um, it's, it's why, you know, I decided to sign the petition to have his special forces tab removed. We've, we've removed special forces tabs for less. Um, in my, uh, during my career, uh, I've seen it anyways. And so there are repercussions to this. And until he decides to do the right thing and have the moral courage to come forward and express himself and hold himself accountable, uh, if in fact he did this um, and not do what our senior leaders consistently do, and that is try to huddle and protect themselves, right? Uh, and to, you know, cover things up. Uh, the, the military is political in its own way. However, when it starts taking the attributes on of the civilian political system, we are going to run sideways to that. Uh, and, you know, if he had issues or concerns um, about President Trump, then he takes them to President Trump because that is who legally, by law, he is the advisor to. Nobody else. He doesn't consult with the sec with the you know speaker of the house and so on and so forth and if you don't have enough guts to do that then uh you know you certainly uh shouldn't be working around the system uh to negatively influence it and endanger the safety and security of americans absolutely sir you know it's it's and beyond general milley uh, I, I i seem to notice something uh, anecdotally, uh, as my days in uniform wound down 2018, 2019, when I retired in October 2019, I'm, I know you saw this, certainly at the flag officer ranks, but a very disturbing trend amongst commissioned officers to, I don't want to say betray their oath, but certainly behave in a fashion that's inappropriate by wading into the political sphere. I, I was never in a registered political party, even though it was my prerogative as a commissioned officer. I could have been a Republican, Democrat, Libertarian, but I chose not to do that because I felt it was undue influence on my subordinates and people I work with. And I kept my politics to myself. I mean, I chat, you chat with people, you know, coffee, you know, water, cooler talk, that sort of thing. But but a very disturbing trend, not just politics, but people doing things. You mentioned the two lieutenant colonels who got in trouble, one in Space Force, and the other. And right or wrong, there seems to be a spat of this going on at the field grade ranks and certainly also at the flag ranks over the past several years. And of course, when it's suitable for the political left, they they relish it. When Alexander Vindman, who was insubordinate to the president of the United States and, in my view, betrayed our foreign policy with his arrogance, thinking he is the subject matter expert on the Ukraine, he makes the policy decisions. No, I've been in Vindman's shoes all over Africa. I don't make the decisions. I offer the best military advice to the ambassador and to the commander of the combatant command. They make the decisions. And if I don't like it, you suck it up, buttercup, and you move on, you make the best of it. Vindman overrode the president's decisions and then betrayed the president of the United States. And he's hailed as a hero by the media. That to me was quite a disturbing trend of civilian political influence interfering with the military chain command. Any thoughts on that one, sir? No, you're absolutely right. I, I agree with you hundred percent on that. And, you know, very well articulated because that's exactly the truth. Remember we, you know, we impeached Donald Trump over a phone call. Yeah. Well, this is a phone call. Right. <laughs> it's more than um, one phone call. <laughs> yeah, it's more than one phone call, right? Uh, and the the behavior characterized in the phone call, you know, is what is at issue here, and that has to be investigated. We we cannot responsibly just try and sweep it under the rug like they're trying to do. Oh, he's a patriot. Oh, I have complete confidence in him. Well, let me tell you something, Lieutenant Colonel Scheller, as an example. I wrote him a letter. I mean, I wrote him a note. I can I, I was, I, I'm in contact with his parents. Um, he's gone through hell. The Marine Corps has, has treated him disrespectfully. Uh, they have relieved him of duty. Um, you know, his wife, uh, unfortunately has struggled with this. Uh, so he's got some, you know, family issues, uh, and he's feeling, uh, left out and alone. Why? Because he did what we asked him to do. Uh, have candor. Uh, we may not have liked, you know, they may not have agreed with, you know, the method, but, you know, I challenge anybody to suggest that he did something illegal, immoral, and negligently unsafe, right? Uh, and 
you know, I would never lose confidence in a guy like that. Uh, it would actually strengthen my strengthen my confidence in him. And I would say, hey, listen, I get what you're saying. You're absolutely right. Uh, or I disagree with you on this level. Uh, but at the same time, you don't do what we just did to him. Uh, and that is a, that is worse uh, than, you know, what he did. And the same thing with Lieutenant Colonel Lohmeyer and, and many others that I've seen. Uh, you know, I made it a practice to be very uh, protective of my guys uh, and gals in the U.S. military that worked for me. I developed a reputation that way. A lot of people didn't like it because my people, because uh, everything that they're doing, I told them to do. So until uh, I can, you know, safe, you know, I can fully understand what the heck we're talking about here. You're not going near my folks because I'm going to protect them. Uh, I owe them. It's like a child that gets in trouble, right? Uh, just because my son on one day is captain of the wrestling team, dating the prom queen and, and getting straight A's. Oh, this is my boy. Well, all right. He throws a rock through a window uh, and the police bring him to my house and, oh, that's not my kid, right? Uh, no, our responsibilities are to take care of our people, right, wrong, or indifferent, hold them accountable uh, and, you know, be responsible uh, for that, you know, for that process. But that's not what happens at the senior levels, to your point, over and over again. And that's what I have a serious problem with. And it needs to be reconciled. Yeah, I'm sorry. Sorry, just a second. I'm just adjusting. Our stream was cut while you were talking there. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, it's been restored. It's been restored. Um, uh, and it's not a data thing on my end. I have a terabyte of download and uh, I do about 25 megabytes upload. So it must have been a YouTube server thing. But uh, no, we caught that. And I've been recording this conversation. So I'll have it for a snippet. And we can put that out later on. But what the general was talking about is being responsible for your subordinates and making sure that uh, they're taken care of before people come after them. Yeah, no, it's it's it's. I, I, I don't know what to say, sir. I mean, honestly, I mean, I, I, I feel like I, I've been betrayed from a standpoint that I spent all this time in Africa teaching and inculcating values to respect civil authority. It's the hallmark. I remember when I was a lieutenant, sir, and my, my battalion commander uh, was a former speechwriter for General Bernard Rogers at NATO. So, you know, that goes mm. back. That goes back a ways. It shows how old we are. But, yeah. but uh, he was uh, he was the speechwriter for General Bernard Rogers. And he remind he told me, he says, when he used to write speech, he said, you know, they talk about White House um, events. And I don't know the current order things, but he said, uh, when in the when the order of precedence amongst government officials, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff was somewhere like number 34 or something like that. So all these civilians came before the chairman. And, and, and I don't know how accurate that is or how true that is today, but I always thought that's amazing. If you go to Moscow, generals are right next to Putin. If you go to Beijing, generals all around the premier. If you go to countries around the world, you see generals all over the place. But in the United States, the single most important member of our military from a standpoint of being responsible for the military ranks only 34th. That speaks volumes to me about the hallmark of civilian control over the military. And to me, it seems that civil military relations are being utterly destroyed by the current political environment. Oh, absolutely. They are. They are being destroyed. Um, and, you know, the military at the senior levels, you know, is playing a large role in this because it, it's all about their next rank, really. I know it. I was there. You know, uh, when I took a stance on post-traumatic stress and TBI in the, in the military, uh, you couldn't find a peer of mine within, you know, a grid square, um, you know, to say, you know, this is the right thing to do. We all knew it was the right thing to do. I got calls from above saying this isn't going to bode well for your career. But I told them it's not it's I'm not doing it for my career. I'm doing it for the health and welfare of the men and women and the families that I'm responsible for. And after 26 months of data, we showed how um, leading from the top in these areas and doing a completely different approach than the Department of Defense was doing. Uh, we had some serious success, more success than anybody was having, but they didn't want to hear it. They want anything to do with it. And then when I, you know, made, made my uh, objections known to the, to the Afghan uh, policy and strategy, uh, they didn't want to hear that. And then the same thing with Africa, right? Now, it's not that I am a problem child and I disagree with everything because that's not the truth at all. But uh, 
I listen to the people on the ground. I listen to our partners and I pass up my best military judgment. And unfortunately, it bumps up against these ideas uh, that aren't consistent with winning. Mm -hmm. And have we won? No. So there's a good argument there that we weren't doing it the right way. But the solutions were coming from, you know, our folks on the ground. And it gets stifled at the top for various political motives, not for sound military judgment. And then those that believe if they disagree, then their career will be over uh, in this idea that you can't make mistakes anymore mm. is even more disruptive because if you can't admit that you made a mistake, you're going to try and cover them up and you're going to try and blame others so that your career doesn't get negatively affected. Uh, and so that's easy to, you know, look down instead of look up or left or right uh, where the problem is. And so to your point, that's, that's, you know, that is the problem. We need reform in how we pick our senior leaders and then how we develop them and then how we promote them further, uh, further through the system. I think that's well stated, sir. And that's my experience. It's uh, and the funny thing is, is that in my view, I mean, I don't know where you sit on this, but I, I can pick 10, 10 flag officers in the army. I can go find 10 colonels just as talented and just as good. We have that level of competence that we can pick and choose the right people. I just think that oftentimes we pick people who seem, as you said, to become more political creatures rather than military leaders. And that's a bit disheartening. Great point, because when I was the aide to the secretary of the army, Tom White, who was a retired brigadier general um, and became secretary uh, of the army under George Bush in his first administration, this guy, I mean, I have so much respect for Tom White. He was such a soldier's leader, right? I mean, a soldier's soldier. Uh, and we were going to our Leavenworth to the first Brigadier General Charm School. Uh, and, you know, as they, you know, nicknamed it, right? right. Um, and he is talking to me on the plane as we're discussing, you know, the trip and everything, uh, flying to Leavenworth. And he says, Don, you got to realize that um, we just picked 30, 30 colonels to be generals. We could take them and we could take them off the list and pick the next 30 in line. And there wouldn't be any significant detriment in the quality of that, those individuals. And when you're, you, you have to remember that you're appointed, not anointed. Yep. And he, he, this is 2002 and 2003. And he goes, that's the problem with the military right now is we've gotten away from those values. And we think we're anointed and we think that we're the best. And we think that we're just, oh, so great. Cause everyone's like, Oh, well, there's a 250,000 to one chance that you'll ever get picked for Brigadier General and blah, 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 blah. blah. And you're the best thing since sliced bread and, you know, all this stuff. Woo, 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 woo. But you can't even get out the, the damn conference room by the time they get done with you because they're, you know, they're telling you how great you are. Um, and, and he said, it's not true. And I'll, you know, he told them that there too. He said, hey, you know, you need to realize this, right? Uh, and, uh, he was, he's absolutely, he's absolutely right. Uh, and you're absolutely right. And I am more surprised when command lists come out and promotion list comes out on who's not selected yeah. than I am on who's selected because we already know who the golden boys are. Right. Yep. Uh, and so it's like, Oh, that's no surprise. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, but this guy, now that's a surprise because the men and women know who the good people are and who's going to fight for them. And then they consistently see that they don't get, they don't get there from here. Uh, and it's not because they're not, they're not qualified. They're not good enough. It's because they don't fit into this club mentality. Uh, you know, the first thing that said to you is welcome to the club. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, what club? <laughs> you know, I never got, an official invitation into the club. Who's your mentor? You got to have a mentor 
in order to make two star, three star, right? Yep. Yep. And I go, I don't have a mentor. Well, you got to get somebody. Well, how do I get somebody? I, I mean, I, I can't pick up the phone and go, hey, uh, for very selfish reasons, uh, <laughs> I, I need you to be my mentor so I can make another two star. star yeah. Right? You know what I mean? <laughs> I got uh, you. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, we were expecting your call. You know, you know what I mean? I mean, what the heck? That's <laughs> uh, crazy. I couldn't do that. And yep. I wouldn't do that. Um, yep. And so um, stick to your guns and you stick to your morals. You stick to your character. You, you, you have candor. You disagree about the right things. And you're not going to get there from here. You're going to be told to retire. Absolutely. Folks, you're listening to Chris White Africa here on the Dob Africa channel. My special guest during the news program came in during the program today is Brigadier General Retired Don Boldick, who is a candidate for the U.S. Senate in New Hampshire, a true patriot. Uh, it's a pleasure to talk to him all the time. Hey, sir, one thing you just said about that, I have had a phrase for that for years, and I said it in private, not around general officers, although a few of them I was very close to. I said, that's a case of uh, the appointed feeling anointed and believing their own press. They believe mm-hmm. they're impressed. Yeah, like you said. Uh, so, um, you know, it's interesting. Uh, a few years ago at the work college, I had a very earnest question from a lieutenant colonel who uh, is an African. He came to me and he's from Tunisia. Now, I, as I mentioned, I was a graduate of the staff college in Tunisia. And so he knew my peers, most of whom were general officers at this stage. And I was a full colonel. And he said, Colonel White, can, can I ask you a question? I said, sure. I said, what's your question? Sir, um, you know so much about Africa. You're such a great leader. I, I how come you're only a colonel? <laughs> to which I kind of chuckled. I said, well, I'm not laughing at your question. Thank you. It's a fair question because you come from a different military. But let me explain something. First off, I was in a career field that has general officer billets, the intelligence corps, and I had a very good file and a very good track record. I had a chance to make general, but that's not what my objective was. My objective was service to the nation and to make a difference. And I knowingly transfer to be a foreign area officer, knowing it was a risk to make lieutenant colonel, let alone full colonel, because I wanted to make a difference for my nation in getting industry and doing things in Africa, because I see that's where the future is down the road. I'm trying to be prescient. And I knew that I'd be fortunate to make lieutenant colonel, never could dream to make full colonel. That's a blessing. I said, there's no general officer position. So it's not like I have failed. I've reached the top level. And by the way, in our military, making full colonel, putting eagles on your collar, that is a sign of tremendous success. That's what I told him because he's, of course, comes from military where you're expected to be a general or you haven't been successful because colonels are a dime a dozen, uh, kind of like they are at the work college, dime a dozen. But <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, but my, my point to that, sir, is that it, it's, it's very much in line with your philosophy. It's service before self. We're not here for self-aggrandizement. If you want that, leave uniform, become an entrepreneur, become a sports icon, become a music celebrity, or become a politician. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And it, it, it's interesting to your point. Um, we will send people to, and I'm just going to use Africom. We have not, you know, we have, we, we have this combatant command system and the idea is that it's regionally focused. Oh, I'm sorry. My, uh, my dog just went off. <laughs> that's, a, that's an early warning system. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's not Victor. It's our Malinois Barra, who is um, a retired uh, military working dog. Um, and she alerts on everything. Um, but anyways, uh, you know, your point is good. We will take people from um, the, uh, you know, regionally focused and send them to U.S. AFRICOM and they have no experience in Africa whatsoever. And we will make them general officers, four-star generals, can't even spell Africa. Mm-hmm. Don't even know where Burkina Faso is. Can't even spell a Wagadougou, right? <laughs> well, that's um, hard for everybody to spell. Let's be fair. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I say, hey, listen, if you have any experience in Africa, you should be able to spell that word. Uh, that, you know, I mean, come on. Yeah, East <laughs> Africa, North Africa, they, they don't have any experience. And then they have to learn. Yeah. Uh, and then the deputy commanders are the same way. And the component commanders are the same way. And it is seriously um, a detriment to our uh, ability to operate effectively and understand what needs to be done when the subordinate commanders and our 
defense attaches and everybody else in the military that supports that mission knows more than the senior leaders and the senior leaders have no respect, no, no, um, no experience, but then the senior leaders don't have enough humility to recognize that Mm -hmm. and operate inside that system. You know, when I, when, when I went to U S Africom to be the operations officer, I said to myself, Hey, what are we doing here? I have no clue. This is huge. Right. And I did 20 months as the operations officer. And then in a very rare occurrence became the special operations command, Africa commander. Right. Mm -hmm. And that never happens. No, it doesn't. So at least I had 20 months of getting to know the continent, understanding the mission set, understanding the different things about it before I became a component commander. And I was the only one. Right. So to your point, we don't do this well. And and my point is we don't give our general officers the knowledge and experience they need to take on some of the jobs that they have. And it shows. Mm -hmm. I think I think you're right in that many respects, sir. And I've seen it in, 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 in other combatant commands, European command, other places where people really weren't ready for the task at hand. Some have the humility, but but it seems to me it's less common as we go forward. The humility that was it's once less there. common. You're right. I agree yeah. with that. So, sir, let me. Uh, you've been very generous with your time. Uh, a lot going on there for you with your campaign and things. So let me let me get to two questions here so we can wrap up. We'll come back to the general Milley topic at the end. But the first one is that. Um, you know, fingers crossed. Uh, and look, I'm, I'm not unbiased. I'm, I'm a Don Bolduc fan. So people should know that up front. Uh, fingers crossed, hoping that you're successful in your Senate campaign and you get to D.C. Sir, six trillion dollar federal budget that was two trillion dollars 21 years ago, six, 300 percent larger than it was when Clinton left office. Six trillion dollars, one point nine if trillion infrastructure bill, 3.5 rescission bill. This is over $10 billion per year. They're sucking 40% of the economy out of this country. You got your hands full. You got a lot of work cut out for you. I'm, I'm assuming that you're a, a fiscal conservative. I think that's the case and that you would like to tackle this, but it's going to be a tough mission. What are your thoughts? Oh, it's going to be a hugely tough mission. And, you know, right now, you know, our economy, the lack of fiscal responsibility is a national security concern and should be for everybody. And, you know, what we, you know, what we have to do is we got to set aside the differences that we're having uh, on the, on the, you know, on the social justice side. And we need to come together like we used to, um, like, you know, like Reagan and O'Neill did and like Clinton and Gingrich did and come together uh, and start working on uh, ensuring economic prosperity by ensuring we deregulate, empowering the private sector um, uh, you know, creating jobs, bringing back manufacturing jobs, uh, becoming again, uh, uh, energy independent, uh, reinstating the pipeline, uh, and, uh, and, and our drilling, uh, so that, you know, we can create more jobs, uh, get people back to work. Um, because if, you know, if we don't do that, uh, we're gonna have we're gonna have some huge problems. Oh, that's that's looking primo right there. Leo Vignans Fernandesborg said respect. Thank you, Chris, and the Brigadier General. Loved hearing and seeing him again. We'll really vote for him if I could. Of course, Leo lives in South Africa, so she can't vote for you, but she can right. have sympathy and support for you. But uh, our U.S. audience is growing once again. We've had a number of people here in the U.S. who are very excited about you being back on the program. All right, we got interrupted by the technology there. You were you were making yeah, so, a point. You know, so yeah, so you know. Uh, we, we, we have to increase our economic uh, prosperity by doing some of the things that I just talked about. Mm-hmm. And we got to get on the same sheet of music here. Uh, but more importantly, you know, uh, we got to we got to get control of our border because that's costing us a tremendous amount of money. Uh, and we're just, you know, spending money hand over fist here uh, on that. And and the other thing is we got to review. We got to do a serious review of programs that are driving up the fiscal irresponsibility. And we got to get rid of the omnibus process that we see over in the Congress, uh, over in the House, because it's just killing us. Uh, We got to have short bills, bills that are a couple pages long at the most and focused on problems. Uh, And if we don't do that, uh, we're going to be in big trouble. And we just have to come together now 
like Democrats and Republicans used to do mm -hmm. over these, the economy, fiscal responsibility and safety and security of Americans. And we have to, I'm not an isolationist, but we got to, we got to fix our own home here. We got to clean our own home up because it's, it's, it's dirty. It's hurting. Uh, and then uh, if we don't, we're going to be in big trouble. We're going to implode with rising inflation uh, and, you know, many other factors that are going to cause the bottom to fall. Remember here in New Hampshire, our New Hampshire budget, and, and I think this might ring true in other states as well. 40% of the New Hampshire budget comes from federal dollars. Mm, yeah, that, that's, that's, not, a, that's not unusual amongst many states. That's, that's insane. Um, so if the federal government decides, hey, we can't afford to help you anymore, the entire bottom falls out of our state economy. And people don't realize uh, how close we are to that. Well, in fact, sir, um, it's used as a weapon against states. If you don't do what we want you to do at the federal level, we'll pull the funding. We won't give you this funding. And that's done by both administrations, both sides of the political aisle. And, and it's really um, a blackmail tool. States have become overly dependent on the federal government for education funding, for highway funding, uh, which is supposed to be a joint venture. And the list goes on and on. It, in my view, is a, is, is a usurping of the Constitution by the federal government, taking on powers not clearly specifically enumerated in the Constitution in violation of Article 10. Those powers revert to the individual sovereign states and our country since the inception of King Franklin Delano Roosevelt has been on a path of the federal government growing like a leviathan, a colossus, overtaking, subsuming all political authority in this country. And I guess you know where I stand on that issue now. <laughs> yeah, well, you're absolutely right. And I stand right with you on that. And it's, you know, it's part of my it's part of, uh, you know, when I go out and I talk to people here in the state of New Hampshire about, you know, getting the federal government under control back in its lane, uh, exercising its enumerated, its enumerated uh, you know, authorities and not getting into uh, the state's business and making them dependent on them because they create a program uh, and then they don't fund the program, but they require the state to, you know, to maintain it. And the state's got to be more disciplined in the, in the federal money that they decide to take in the grants. It's, it's ruining local communities. Absolutely. Listen, I've got breaking news here for you, sir, not related to General Milley or Joe Biden or anything like that. But John Groveser, my co-host from WSMN, who you've joined us with on the program, is in the chat. And he said uh, the general's got my vote. And of course, he's a New Hampshire resident. So there's one vote already in the tally for, for, for Don Baldick for Senate. So I just thought I'd let you know about that. He's, awesome. He's, he's got your vote. Uh, anyway, you've got his vote, I should say. That's pretty awesome. So let me ask this question. Uh, coming back to General Milley as we wrap up, sir, and thank you so much, generous, for your time. I realize that as the Senate campaign moves forward and and and, and the days dwindle, uh, getting a chance to speak with you is going to become a premium thing. So I'm very grateful for this time that we've had uh, the past couple months with you coming on here and on the Common Sense Conservatives. And, and we'll, we'll take advantage of this while we get the chance to speak to you. But let me get your thoughts on this. Okay, so General Milley, Assume that this stuff is true, but whether it's true or not, uh, are you concerned? I know I'm gravely concerned about a permissive environment in which this politi political, civilian political stuff is creeping into our officers. And it's not just the flag officers now. In our time, it was the flag officers. Now it's down to field grade officers. And I'm concerned if it makes its way to company grade officers. The one thing I told people about Iraq um, for, for nothing for against our efforts there, nothing for against foreign policy. But what we learned from Iraq, I thought was all the wrong lessons about an army. We have a generation, two generations, because I say generations five years, so two or three generations of officers and NCOs who've grown up thinking they just go to an environment, they're handed brand new equipment, they go fight, they get all the resources in the world. And that's not how the army works. I mean, I'm used to patching together gamma goats and M880 pickup trucks, you know, and bailing twine and keep my generators running and stuff like that. There is no new equipment. This is what you go to war with and you make it work. I think we've, we've learned the wrong lessons from there. Not only do we have that inherent problem with people who are now becoming field grade officers and eventually generals, we also have what I think is an incredibly permissive environment if people say the things that the politicians want to hear. And they shouldn't be saying anything unless they're offering the best military advice. Are you concerned about this environment at all, sir? Oh, I'm absolutely concerned about it. And, and I've, I've uh, written about the fact that I've already seen it happen to our command sergeant majors and our sergeant major and sergeants majors in their rank. Uh, you know, they become like the officer, uh, the general officer that they want to be a senior enlisted advisor for. 
Um, and, you know, I know when I picked mine, I picked Rich Pugliese, a Navy SEAL. I picked him because, one, he was the best man for the job or the best person for the job. But most importantly, uh, because I knew that he was not going to suck up to me, that he wasn't there because he was going to, uh, you know, uh, want to get on my coattails and come with me all the way up the chain. Well, we all knew that wasn't going to happen because the writing was already on the wall that I wasn't going in, you know, past one star um, because of some of my, uh, you know, contrarian views about things. But nonetheless, it's going all the way down and it's in our commissioning systems now. Uh, and it's very, very dangerous, the type of officer that we're creating, particularly in our academies. And I want to do a wide range sweeping review of our, our, our academies and, you know, how we're growing these officers when 60 percent of them get out after five years and their mission is to create the career officer for the military. When they're being taught CRT and social emotional learning ahead of other critical skills, when they're being forced to get the shot and if they don't get the shot, then they can't participate in the full range of cadet uh, activities. Uh, you know, when they're being told that they're the greatest thing since sliced bread and they're, the, you know, America's best and nobody's as good as them and blah, blah, blah. Hell, in my opinion, the best commissioning system is OCS, non-commissioned officers, 90 day course. It's a, it's it's a quality course. Get you get you your lieutenant in 90 days. They come from the ranks. They're already proven leaders. Boom, boom, boom. Now, you can debate that with me. I don't have anything against the other commissioning systems, but I don't believe they're accomplishing the mission that we need them to accomplish. Uh, and this whole woke, uh, you know, uh, ideas of leadership uh, and this this idea of leadership that I come first. And if I'm going to succeed, it's because I'm taking care of myself is very bad. And uh, we got to nip it in the bud now. Um, it is why I got nominated by President Trump to sit on the Army Education Board. But because I got nominated by President Trump, I was removed from consideration for that position. Uh, guys with ideas like me for the Army education from, you know, enlisted all the way up to E9 and from, you know, 01 to 010, um, you need guys, you need guys like that coming in and advising uh, on a better way, a different way to educate our officers so that we have officers with moral courage, with candor, uh, and, uh, you know, different than what we're producing now. I, I've seen it. I'm worried about it. Well, sir, I, I think that you're just being uh, hyperbolic and over the top here. I've just got to inform you. I mean, honestly, at our, at our academies, I think there's nothing wrong with abandoning the mathematical skills. Why would artillerymen need to understand mathematics? It doesn't make any sense. And frankly, I think we need kinder, gentler, cuddlier officers coming out of the Cadet Corps in ROTC and at West Point, the Naval Academy, the Air Force Academy. I mean, honestly, sir, I want to understand white rage. What's wrong with that? I want to understand white rage. Wait, wait, that sounds like white rage. Sorry. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> uh, sorry. Yeah, it's and, and to have General Milley actually say that, right, that he's looking forward to to become to getting in touch with his white rage. It is unbelievable. I said it when he said that. I said, well, you are definitely the wrong man for the job uh, as chairman of the Joint Chiefs staff. If that is what um your worldview you know, is. You need help with that, right? It's unbelievable. Yeah. Unbelievable. I mean, I don't get it. We, we, we Listen, um, my first three platoon leaders in the Signal Corps when I was enlisted were women. I thought you had to be a female to be an officer in the Signal Corps. I'm being facetious, but but the first three, and they were fine. One was a rock star. One was good. The other was okay. Uh, it's just a consequence of who they were and how they apply themselves. Uh, when I was in, in, in a Signal unit, one third of my unit was black. One third was white. One third was Puerto Rican. Um, and I know Puerto Ricans might consider themselves white, but you get my point. Uh, we had no issues, no any problems. We fought alongside each other. We prepared for the Soviet onslaught and we made it happen and we got right. along. And, you know, I, I, I've, I've had black general officers who've been my senior raider. I've had white general officers been my senior raider. I've worked with uh, with Hispanic uh, officers, with with Asian officers. Never an issue. This 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 poisonous bile that they're inflicting into our society and into our service academies is very frightening. It's very frightening. And I don't understand how anybody who cares about this country can sit back and just say, well, you know, it's, it needs to be taught. Right. No. Hey, we're seeing it in our schools. Uh, uh, you know, 
Um, my grandchildren are negatively affected by it. We're, we're seeing it all around. It's very divisive. Um, and, you know, it's just, it, you know, I mean, it's just wrong. And, and I have to echo what you said, 33 and a half years. I'm not saying that there isn't people who are racist. That's not my point. Yep. And I'm not saying that there isn't people that are racist that are in the military, outside the military, or in any profession that we have, wherever you go, right? Um, that is unfortunate. But to suggest that we have this systemic problem in the military that has to be addressed in this manner is completely uninformed by the facts. Uh, 33 and a half years commanding at every single level. My experiences were the same as yours, and I never dealt with a racist issue, right? Never came to my desk. Now, a whole bunch of other issues have <laughs> that I wish hadn't come to my desk, but they did, and we dealt with them effectively, but never that. And that should say something, right? It certainly says something to me, right? And, you know, what our military, you know, has done and the obstacles that we've overcome uh, in order to, uh, you know, in order to make it, uh, you know, uh, equal uh, and 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 not, uh, you know, and, and you mentioned it earlier, you worked for three female officers. One was a rock star, one was mediocre, and the other one was just, you know, hey, okay. That's the military. That's yep. what you're going to have, right? Um, but generally, the rock star is a rock star, and that's good up to a certain point, and then what makes them a rock star now somehow becomes, uh, no, we really don't want you at this level because you you speak the truth or you're, you know, you have too much candor. We're going to we're going to jump over you and take the OK one, the one that we know we can manipulate, the one we know we can handle, <laughs> the one we know that will do what we tell them to do because they're in, they're OK uh, and, and they'll, you know, they'll appreciate, you know, the break they got inside this system. That's what we do. And that's wrong. Absolutely. And, and it leads to, um, piss poor senior leadership and strategic thinking. Yeah. And not to mention the fact that the U S army mediocre all, at best, at right? mediocre at best. And, and not to mention the army doesn't really start teaching officers to think strategically for the most part across the board until they go to war college when they're senior lieutenant colonels and colonels. That's another thing I've written about and would have changed. Should right. be introduced as captains. Uh, doesn't That's become the main. That's exactly right. That's wow. my opinion as well. <laughs> Either I'm going to be on your staff, or we're going to run together for president, vice president. Some I point. would also redo the rank structure. <laughs> yep. Oops. You know, there's. I'm going to run out of power here. I think. Um, well, let's 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 we'll save the power. We'll save that for another conversation. Sir, how about we do that? We talk about the rank structure. Yeah, let's where your do phone that. Dies. Let's, let's do, do that. that. But let me, let, let me let me thank you once again. It's a pleasure. You've been very generous with your time, and I appreciate you coming on, even though you got distracted by people coming and do a business with you. I'll give you the last uh, comment, and if you want to throw something in there before your phone dies on us, anything you want to share with people, whether it's about General Milley, because that's why we brought you on. But we've covered as usual a whole host of factors and topics here. Anything you want to share with the audience, folks, or, or sir, you're welcome to. Listen, I just want to I just want to share with the audience that we're you know, we are really at a time here in our country where we have some decisions to make. Career politicians have got us into a bad situation um, and a divisive political parties reinforce that special interests and lobbyists. We must we must make a change in 2022. We have to go with people that have proven themselves as public servants and that want to do the job for you. And don't look at going to Washington, D.C. as a career or a way to live off of um, our, the taxpayers for the rest of their lives. Uh, and that's what I want to do. And if if you can talk about my campaign, DonBaldick.com, you can get people to either donate or to tell other people, hey, let's, uh, you know, let's support the general. He's going to go down there and he's going to make a difference for us. He's going to work for us. Um, you know, I, you know, I mean, I'd really appreciate it. I was on the phone yesterday with President Trump. Uh, he put out a note that uh, Facebook has banned uh, supporting me. Uh, and I am greatly um, honored to have earned, um, you know, his trust and confidence, because that's what we did. We earned it. We stayed true to our character and integrity. We stayed true to our messaging of God, family, community and country. Uh, he noticed it. He reached out 
And I am eternally grateful for that because that's the kind of America, you know, that we want. We want an America that's economically strong, fiscally responsible, and looks at and protects the safety and security of Americans. Well, that's a fantastic way to wrap up the program, sir. Thank you very much for that. Appreciate it. Uh, for those who are wondering if the general has uh, uh, any ties or links to the Trumpster, well, it's pretty clear he does. Uh, nominated for a position, and now the president's reached out to him. And I guess that's uh, it's kind of like my original channel was censored on YouTube. A lot of people say that's a mark of success if you've been censored. Same on, same right. on Facebook. But listen, folks, if you're in the States and you want to help out, go to his uh, website, check it out, learn about uh, General Boldick's positions on things if you want to contribute. You can do that here in the U.S. Those overseas, you just want to learn about it and um, and, and empathy and sympathy. Uh, you can follow his campaign. Please do that. And we look forward to your success uh, getting elected to office. That'd be fantastic. And I'm going to have to at some point um, take advantage of that I know you and and maybe find a way to get the Trumpster on one of my shows. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that would be that would be incredible. That would definitely be something else. Hey, sir, thanks a lot for your time. God bless and have a safe weekend uh, and take care of yourself and your family. You you do the same. Uh, God bless you and all your listeners. And uh, don't worry, you will always be prioritized uh, in in my schedule. So I will never be too busy. Oh, that is awesome, folks. You heard it right here. Fantastic. So I'm going to put you in waiting room and give you a chance to drop off there while I close out the program. And as I said, enjoy your weekend. Take care of yourself. Thank you. God bless. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that was Brigadier General Don Boldick, retired U.S. Army uh, Special Forces officer, 10 tours in Afghanistan, former commander Special Forces Africa Command, uh, an organization I worked extensively with across Africa. I'll tell you what, every time I talk to the general, it's like we, we got a lot of things in common, simpatico, and we have the same issues with the way that uh, our military is run. So it's fascinating. Uh, we asked him to come on to talk about his thoughts on General Milley. He was on Fox News yesterday, about a 40 second clip, and uh, now he's been on here. Thank you all so much.